All right, it's time for us to get into the Word today. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going through the series, uh, Becoming a Mature Church, uh, through Paul's letter to the, the, his first letter to the church at Corinth that we have in 1 Corinthians, and uh, moving through. Uh, we want to talk about what does it mean to be mature, and um, uh, we, we might, you might be in a place in your life where you have completed uh, natural growth, natural development, all those are good. But we are, we are this morning focusing on what it means uh, relating to a condition of fully developing, fully maturing in areas even beyond the natural, even beyond the physical. Uh, so let's just get into the Word, and then I think these things will kind of kind of fall into place as we begin to embrace them. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll begin at verse 6 this morning. If you would stand with me as we read the Word of God, we stand in reverence uh, of the Word. God's Word is powerful. It can change our lives. We're thankful for it, and uh, we reverence the, uh, the Lord of His Word that speaks with His Spirit to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. Let's read it together. Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for... If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart, listen, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I want to thank you today for your word. And I pray, God, today, Lord, that we would not just be natural people, but uh, that we would be spiritual people so that we might discern spiritual truths that you have for us today, dear God. Not for natural wisdom, but for spiritual wisdom that you impart through the shaping and molding and work of your Holy Spirit, God. And there are some things that no preacher, no teacher, no human institution, no textbook, uh, no printed word can teach us. And we're asking this 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 day, these moments, in these moments, that your Spirit will teach us the spiritual truths that will shape our lives. We ask this today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Yet among the mature, he says, we do impart wisdom. Now, if you remember already in chapter 1 and then the beginning of chapter 2, uh, Paul may be, have come off to some people as they've read it like, well, he must be anti-education or something. But we're not just talking about knowledge here. This is about wisdom. Wisdom, if you will, is a, a, 
the ability to apply knowledge in real time, in life. So it's a, it's a practical knowledge, if you will, uh, applicable knowledge, and these things are going on. But he talks about a maturity again, and so his implication is that there may be some of you that are immature. It doesn't have to do with your uh, knowledge of physical things. It, it does have nothing to do with your level of education on the natural world and and uh, the education, be able to read and do math and history and all these kinds of things. This is not about that. This is a maturity that is beyond something you can learn in a classroom. It's something uh, more significant than that, and it's in the, the broader scope of your existence than the narrow area of just the natural, just the physical, just the intellectual. He says this wisdom is secret. That's not uh, because God's trying to keep it hidden, but it is hidden, though Jesus reveals some of these things. But he says that people didn't understand it. That's it. ultimately why Jesus was crucified, because they, they were not thinking on spiritual terms, only natural terms. And what Jesus said in terms of repentance, in terms of dying to yourself, in terms of taking up a cross, of following Jesus, of, of loving your enemy, all these kinds of things that are just kind of radical notions that do not seem practical. All right? They just don't seem that way to the natural mind. And so because they weren't thinking about things spiritually, they crucified Jesus, he says. But Jesus embodies what it is to have this wisdom or this, this light in a new uh, facet of our existence. Uh, in the book of John, the Gospel of John, Chapter 1 is one we, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it starts talking about the Word, and there's a lot of almost philosophical kind of stuff there that a lot of people get lost in, and we, we kind of check out. But listen to what it says in First John, or I'm sorry, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9. It says, The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. In other words, world, your creator came down, he came into the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Verse 11 of chapter 1 in John. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. The people that he created, the people that were created in his image, he came to him, the creator. Your creator was among you and you didn't know him. Verse 12. But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Aren't you glad you can be a child of God today? Aren't you glad? What, a, what an audacious uh, claim that we are as, as Christians, as people have been born again, born once of the flesh and then born of the Spirit as well, that we are children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. The Bible says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, he said in verse 8 of Corinthians in Paul's letter going back. He said, Nobody understood these realities that, of who Jesus was. You know, we have a hard time understanding that the Son of God was a human. But they were with Jesus in the flesh and they had a hard time understanding that Jesus was fully God. It's um, it's interesting concept if you think about it. You know, they missed it. And you know who the, the people that missed it the most were? It was the, the most religious people. The most religious people. Uh, uh, people like the Pharisees that they were trying so so diligently and probably many of them were well-meaning but we give the pharisees a hard time but they probably many of them at least initially were well-meaning in their endeavor to try to understand the mind of god to try to get down what it meant to be in relationship with god and so they took the law and they began to realize some people are finding the loopholes and so what they did is they start to build up and you got to make more rules to make sure the loopholes are closed and, and uh, make things more comprehensive and and just kind of going at it from there 
there and, and all those kinds of things. But not only the Pharisees, who were t- tended to be the more conservative, but also the Sadducees, they were the, they were the liberals of their time. They didn't believe in eternity. They didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in heaven and certainly not hell. There's a lot of people in that place today. They missed, they missed it uh, as well. But so did the scribes. So did the teachers of the law. So did the Sanhedrin, which were the religious kind of political leaders of the time. They all missed really what Jesus wanted and what He intended in His coming. The Creator was among them. I remember, I, I maybe have shared this before, but I remember one of the churches that I pastored one time, I had a guy came to me and he said, you know what, I've joined the Baptist church, I've joined the, uh, this group and that group and different organizations, and he said, there has been no group more difficult to join than the church of the Nazarene. You are a hard group to be a part of. I said, no, it's just because he had a particular habit. He had a thing that he was doing that, that inhibited him from being a, being a member of the church uh, uh, because he didn't want to give that thing up. And, and so I said, no, it's not hard to be a Nazarene. In fact, the truth is that you could probably fool the preacher, not even be a Christian, and as long as you followed all the rules, uh, you would be received into membership. You know, you attended church and you did everything you were supposed to do. You could follow the letter of the law and you could make it into being a member of the church it's not hard to be a member of the church what is difficult is living life in the spirit and what a lot of Christians have a hard time with is that God's call on our life is not just to, to, to live, go to school, go to work, go home, go on vacation once a year or every other year and have kids and raise them up and do this or do that and do these kind of functions through life and live and then die and then over and you go to heaven. But God's call on you today is to live beyond the natural living beyond the physical, to be, if you will, otherworldly. Uh, to, be, to live beyond your physical existence. You ever want, what does it mean to be spiritual? You ever thought about that? Let me make some, let me make some points from the Scripture here as, we, as you grapple with that kind of, kind of thing. Uh, number, number one, what we're talking about is something that is not naturally perceivable. All right. In fact, he, he talks about in verse 9, he said, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. There are a lot of people who miss it every time. They're not, they don't see what God's doing. They don't hear what, what He's saying because they're missing. There's something deeper. We're always, you know, we're always constrained by the physical, by the natural. We want everything to hit us in the natural. You know why so many people are consumed with physical healing? And I believe in physical healing. I believe in the morale. But you know why so many people are consumed with it? Because it's something they can see, touch, feel you know why idols you know why we want something that we can see and we can kind of focus on in our worship and sometimes people have to have an idol that they've made or whatever is because we want things of the spirit to be manageable we want them to be able to be controlled by the physical we don't we want to be spiritual people but we still want to live in the natural in other words i cannot accept that god is able to do in his spirit through in my life in, in my existence something that i cannot do in my own strength and power but god is asking and desiring to do something more now there are some areas we understand this in that God is wanting to do something beyond the natural, or that there is more to our faith in Christ Jesus than what is just in the natural. So I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Maybe I could, could you explain love? Explain somebody falling in love. Say, well, you, you like the person. What, what does it mean to like a person? Why do you like a person? How is it that you fall in love? Well, some people, if you had some kind of an, a biologist here, we would try to explain love. They said, well, there's some kind of chemical reaction in the brain that comes on by certain qualities or traits uh, uh, that, that, that either th- come through senses, through our eyes, through our, what we hear, the sound of the voice, through what we smell. All these kind of factors uh, come together to form something in our brain that clicks. There's a chemical 
chemical reaction. We are attracted to a person. We begin to have an affinity with that person. And they would try to tell you and explain to you that the emotion of love, if you will, is just a chemical reaction. And they're going to explain it. And they're going to explain it all in natural and scientific, biological, physical ways. This is why it is. And it's hard for us to grasp this idea that love is more than a chemical reaction in your brain. All right? So, just so you know, husbands, uh, it's not going to be romantic if you go home and you tell your wife, hey, honey, I just want you to know that, man, you really set off a wonderful chemical reaction in my brain. Uh, that's, that's not going to be real, probably romantic to them. Uh, uh, because there is something that we understand that's beyond the physical when it comes to love. It's beyond the physical. That's why things of this world don't satisfy. Now, we say that, but there are so many of us, even in, within the church, and there are so many people in the world who are pursuing things in the natural. They think that natural things, things of this world, not spiritual things, not divine things, not things of heaven, not the things of God, but the things of this world are what satisfy. And it's even infiltrated the church with kind of this prosperity gospel that, all oh, right, you're missing something in your life, and if you give money to the preacher, then you'll get blessed a hundredfold, and you'll get rich, and then you'll find fulfillment. And I want to say, I want to shake people and say, that's of the flesh, that's the natural. There is something beyond the natural that your spirit is longing for. And we're trying to put a round peg into a square hole. Actually, we're trying to put a worldly peg into a cross-sized hole. And it's not working. It doesn't work. Our search is uh, too often distracted by the things of this world. You can't neglect the spiritual foundation of your humanity. You cannot neglect the fact that you are not primarily a physical being. You primarily are a spiritual being. A lot of people think, well, I'm, I'm a, I am a physical person and I want to have a spiritual moment. And what God's saying is, no, 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 you are a spiritual being that has a physical moment in your short span of time here on earth, but I'm calling you to live life in the Spirit. Second observation is about spiritual things. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Spirit of the world has to do with worldliness, with uh, a sense of hedonism. You know, hedonism is a, is a philosophy of the age in which we live, that I want to gratif gratify every desire of the flesh. And the faster the better. So if it be sexual desire, if it be uh, prideful desire, if it be physical desire of any kind, that's, that's the goal of life. Fulfill those desires and you'll have longing. The problem is, it, if you do fulfill it, you, do, it, you feed the monster, it wants more, always got to have more. It's not fulfilling. It's not what we really need. It's playing to the natural person and not the foundation of who we are, the core of who we are being spiritual, spiritual beings. You can't neglect the spiritual foundation of your life. Our society has known this for, since its beginning. In fact, our, our culture that we live in still has residue of this. Right? I'm not saying it's all, still there, but that's why our military has chaplains. Now, guess what happens? Worldliness wants to interfere with that kind of stuff and begin to dictate, no, chaplains, you can't talk about spiritual things, only about natural things, which is offsetting some of that. But that's why our hospitals have chaplains. And, and by the way, that's a calling of God that we desperately need. Even all the religions I've heard people say see all the religions of the world that just shows you that nobody can be right and there's not one doesn't mean nobody's right it just means that everybody recognizes in every place and every time and every culture even cultures that are unaware of each other recognize there's something more than the natural there's something more than we can ever understand through science or education or our own observation and experience there's something beyond that we're longing for and it is things of the spirit Things of the Spirit, Spirit of God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. He gives us His Spirit. Uh, we're taught, verse 13 says, that we're taught by the Spirit. Taught by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit teaches in deeper ways than just informational. 
know what that means? That means that you can, you can join a Bible study and you can learn a lot about God and it can all be natural and it never translates into spiritual realities in your life. And it also means this. You can be the sharpest person in the room. You can be the most intelligent person. You can know the most about the Bible. But you can miss out on spiritual life even when there's someone who has no understanding of the Word of God, they've, they're not able to read the Word of God, they've never been exposed to the Word of God, but they have a hunger for spiritual things, God's Spirit becomes their teacher. God's Spirit becomes their teacher. Not taught by human wisdom. Um, there was a, a, a story of, uh, of, of a meeting. Uh, during a meeting, an angel appeared to the chairman of this board and, and said to him, Due to your kindness and your generosity, you can have either unending good looks, you can have unending supply of money, or you can have unending wisdom. What is it that you would like? And without hesitation, the chairman of the board says, uh, I want unending wisdom. And with that, there's a flash, the angel disappears, and uh, the board members are all sitting there looking around, and they look to the chairman of the board, and they say, well, say something. To which he replies, I should have taken the money. You know, um, there's some things, though, only the Spirit of God can teach you. <laughs> it's beyond the natural. There are some things you say, well, I've got a lot of life experience under my belt. Well, there's some things that life experience will not teach you. That's great. But it will not teach you. Only the Spirit of God can teach you certain things. Well, I've gone to Bible college. I've gone to seminary. I've got my Ph.D. in religion and Bible. And there are some things that only the Spirit of God can teach you. Spiritual things. Spiritual things. Um, how, how do you read the Bible? Do you read the Bible? Listen, this is, I think this is important for a lot of Christians today. Do you read the Bible for information? Do you read the Bible in the natural? Uh, are you looking for your marching orders? Are you wanting uh, direction from the Lord? What, do you, what, what are the reasons? Let me, let me encourage you to do something. This takes patience and it takes an act of, of kind of becoming in tune with things of the Spirit. Uh, uh, the Bible talks, I'll give you Psalm 119, verse 15. The psalmist says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I'll meditate on your precepts. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 20 says, 28, 26, ver verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for spiritual words. There's, there begins to be this reality that, that things that we do, even in the life of the church, we can do them in the natural and limit ourselves, or we can do them in the Spirit. In other words, I think I've said before, there are people who have PhDs uh, with uh, the Bible, and uh, they know all about the Bible. They can quote you all kinds of chapters and verses of the Bible. But they're not spiritual people. They're just natural people because they've got the facts down. They've memorized the words, but they've never gotten in touch with the Creator, with the author, with the one who sent His Spirit to inspire these words to be written. They've never come in contact with that. And there's a lot of people who have eloquent language when they pray. They pray in good King James English if you will, but they've never really begun to the place where they didn't come and just issue a bunch of requests to God and they've just go through the motions or they've read a prayer or whatever, where they've come to the place where they've communed with the Spirit of God. Paul says to the church of Rome, he said, sometimes there are times where I don't even know what to pray, but he says, because God's Spirit is working in my spirit, there are groans that are too deep. They're too deep for me to even understand. But I know when I've come out of the closet of prayer that I've been with God. I've been with God. Growing up uh, as a child, I, I, was, I was never afraid uh, to ride in the car with anybody. I, I just had never really thought of, the, of the, the danger of being in a vehicle with someone and uh, the, what could potentially take place. And, and, um, and I, so I'd ride around with uh, my parents or other people and just never thought about how dangerous it might be or, or anything like that. I mean, I just, I just went along 
uh, and, and did it. And I remember when I turned 16 and I got my driver's permit, and the first time that I kind of got behind the wheel and um, on the on the road and and was driving down the road and uh, all the all the pressures that were on me and and all that kind of stuff and my mom was in the passenger seat and then from that moment all of a sudden like man whoever's driving's got a lot they're thinking about staying between the lines and making sure you go a certain speed and making sure nothing comes out in front of you you got to hit the brakes and all those kinds of things all of a sudden all this it was like a new world that I'd enter into. I entered into this new world of, whoa, all this stuff. And all this, all this time, it wasn't that someone wasn't uh, paying attention to staying between the lines and when to accelerate, when to break, and when to turn and where to go and all that kind of stuff. I had just never considered all of those things because I was just along for the ride. I was just kind of present without a reality, without ever recognizing that. And I want you to understand, when we talk about the natural person, we talk about someone that whether you recognize it or not, you may be in the physical you may be living life in the natural but all around you the spirit of God is working in the world uh, they're just unaware of it but once you taste and see that the Lord is good once you go on in and are born of the spirit uh, I know I, you, it's got to be that your heart is yearning for something more that this world cannot satisfy I've tasted as something beyond the physical it's beyond this world it's of the world that come. It's of the kingdom of God. It's of the spirit of God. And it's real and it's powerful. And I begin to have this whole new world opens up for the believers. Those are born of the spirit. So how do I allow the spirit of, to teach me? Well, first of all, you have to begin to, to remove yourself from, from, from the natural. Uh, the distractions, I should say. Uh, remove distractions. The Bible talks about finding a closet of prayer or a small room of prayer uh, away from distractions. Turn off your phone. Listen, if you're praying, I want you to understand, Jesus is not going to text you. All right? He is not going to send you an email. He is not going to post for something on Facebook. There's just going to be a time in your life where you've got to turn that off to hear from Him. There's a time when entertainment has to be curbed. Uh, turn the music off. I've had people say, well, I just have a good time of prayer listening to Caleb. Okay, well, Caleb's got some good music. That's wonderful. But there's a time when you don't need to hear positive, encouraging Caleb. You need to hear the Spirit of God stirring in your soul. And it seems so unnatural for us because it's not about the natural man. It's about the spiritual man. It's about living into the spirit. It's about yielding. There are a lot of people who are unknowingly, or maybe consciously in some ways, quenching the spirit of God. You quench the spirit of God. It, it's amazing to me how many people tell me, you know, well, God spoke to me, but I didn't go to the altar. It's like, really? That, I, want, I want you to understand what that is. That's called disobedience. It's like, you know, I knew that God was telling me to witness, and I just did not do it. Really? And the more that we quench the Spirit when He's trying to lead us and when He's trying to give us direction, the more difficult it is to hear Him at other times. And certainly, you can't be a spiritual person, spiritual Christian, if you're resisting that same Spirit. And then, intentionally, looking beyond the surface of events. In your prayer time, I need, to, I need to finish up here. I want to wrap up here. But uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Set your mind on things that are above. So what's going on with COVID? Well, we're upset because we're inconvenienced because of it. We're a social distancing. Nobody likes that. We're a, we're a friendly church. We want to hug people. We want to shake hands with people. And so we get all bent out of shape. But the spiritual mind is saying, What, God, are you doing in the midst of COVID? What are you doing during pandemic? Hurricanes come and we're saying, okay, what do we need to do to clean up the mess afterwards? And, and that's good. Some of that's good. I'm not saying, and I'm not bent out of shape from time to time either. But what I'm saying is when we begin to lean into the natural man, when we begin to uh, uh, listen and, uh, and, and, and incline our ear to what is the natural, what is the physical, what can we do, what can we control, what are our frustrations, what do we do in our actions and on our side of things, instead of on the side of the Spirit, we're missing out on what it means. And he's saying, I want you 
to set your mind on things above. So for, for many of us, and let me just tell you, your mind isn't going to be set on things above when you're feeding on soap operas. Your mind's not going to be set on things above when you're listening to the discouraging country music all the time. Your mind is not going to be set on things above when you're consumed with politics more than you are what God's Spirit is doing in your family, in your community, in your church, and in the world today. You see, he's talking, to, when he's talking about the natural person and the spiritual person, he's not talking to the world and saying, you guys got to go from natural to spiritual. He's talking to the church and he's saying to the Christians that are in Corinth it's time for you to mature you understand physical things you know you've got to get a job you know you've got to have food to eat tonight you know you need to take a bath you know you need to be healthy you know these things you understand these things you know how to pay for things at the store and file your taxes and you got all the physical things you got those things down but what you don't have down is a priority on the most important thing the thing that will last throughout eternity and that is the things of of the Spirit. And one of the problems in the church in America today is not that we don't know the truth or that we need more truth. The problem today is that we're no longer spiritual people. We're not a spiritual church. We're not a spirit-filled church. We're just natural people. And the good we do and the teaching we do and the preaching we do and singers, the singing we do sometimes... We could do it without God. We could do it without any power. We don't need the Spirit anymore to teach us, we think, because we're in the natural man. We're in the natural man. A.W. Tozer said this. He said, The Spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for His people. This was God's plan for you from the beginning. Not that you would get religion. Not that you would go to church on Sunday. Not that you would have five Bibles in your living room or on the bookshelf or on your nightstand by your bed. But that you would know the fullness of the spiritual life. That you would be called to live beyond the natural. Be called to live beyond what you are able to do in your own power, in your own ability. And you would live more fully into the spiritual. That your eyes would be set on the things of the Spirit. The things that are above your mind would be set on things that are holy and pure and of heaven and of the kingdom to come. And what would it change in your life today if you would say, you know what, I'm really good at the natural, but God help me because my heart is stirring within me. I want more of the Spirit of God. How would you raise your children differently? And we've got them focused on sports. and Oh, that's great. I'm not against sports. And play, playing ball and doing these things and running them to the practice. And we spend hours every week. Listen to what I'm trying to tell you. This is your pastor's heart speaking. We spend hours every week investing in their physical education so they know math and reading and they can play sports and they can throw the ball through the hoop and they can hit it with a bat or they can kick it with their foot. And how much have we neglected the things of the Spirit in the life of our children and no wonder they grow up and they walk away from God because we have exhibited to them only what is natural, only what we can do ourselves. And our generation coming up says about the church, they say that's nothing but an organization. It's nothing but a sociological phenomenon when the reality is the body of Christ is to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's to live in the fullness of the Spirit of God. It is that we live beyond the natural into the supernatural. That there is something going on among God's people that we could not do apart from God's Spirit coming and working among us. Working in us and working through us. We need the Spirit of God. Let me close with this. <clears throat> There's lots of things that you can use for transportation. You can drive a car. You can take a train. You can uh, take a boat. Uh, you can do a lot of things. And... Uh, and uh, lots of those different kinds of transportation. But there is one mode of transportation, a, uh, a plane, that I think is different than other modes of transportation. And that is simply this. A car, you can stop. And you're fine. 
Uh, you can be in a boat, you can turn the motor off, and you'll drift for a little ways, eventually you're going to stop. Um, all these other modes, a bicycle, you hit the brakes and you stop. And it's fine, you can do that. You just start back up at some point. But a plane, if you are up in the air and you're making progress and you're in a plane and you just turn the engines off, you know what's going to happen immediately? You crash. Listen to what I wanted you to hear today. The spiritual life is not one of a vehicle of stop and go, make a little progress till it gets hard, make a little progress till it gets convenient, pull over to the side of the road, stop, get out, sit a little while, take a break. This was too hard. This cost me too much. I wasn't ready for this and those kinds of things. The spiritual life is one like an airplane. It's move forward. I've got to move forward or I'm going to die. I can't stay where I'm at anymore. I have a hunger for the things of God. I cannot hold back anything. I need more of the th- the things of the Spirit. I know that my longing within me is not for things of this world. Things that will seek to appease me for a moment. It's not going to be found on Netflix. It's not going to be found in another sexual relationship with somebody else. It is found only in the things of the Spirit. And that's where my longing is today. And I hope today that you would recognize I want to get up in that plane and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to hit the accelerator and I'm going to keep on going. And I may not understand it and I may have the manual and I may have read all the Bible and I'm not getting all it but I know this one thing that if I were to seek after the things of the Spirit that His Spirit will teach me His Spirit will mold me His Spirit will work through me like never before these are the promises and truths of Scripture what does it mean to be a mature church it means that we as God's children move beyond the natural and focused on the natural And we move into life in the spiritual to be spiritual men and women of God. I want you to stand with me today if you would.